important lessons I have learned from my studies of drugs, and they all sum up, really, to the fact that drugs are what we make them. Uh, that it's we who determine whether drugs are destructive or whether they're beneficial. It's not any inherent property of drugs. And you can look at the history. It's fascinating to look at the history of drugs and to see how they've changed over time. I mean, coffee was an entheogen in the old days when it was first discovered. Its first use was by groups of early Muslim mystics who took it up as a once-a-week ritual. They would, groups of men would meet, I think, on Thursday nights and drink large quantities of coffee and stay up all night chanting and praying until dawn. And it was clearly recognized, this was believed, coffee was thought to be a magical plant that had special properties. It could induce spiritual experiences. You didn't use it all the time. If you don't use coffee all the time, it's a very powerful drug. It's a very powerful stimulant. Another very clear principle of pharmacology and, and uh, drug studies is that when you use any drug frequently, the effects begin to disappear. The body adapts to it. You know, there's a wonderful, uh, there was a, a great physiologist named Walter Cannon who in, proposed the term homeostasis in the early years of this century. That is the principle that it means remaining the same, staying the same. And it's the principle that no matter how you try to throw the body off equilibrium, it will tend to return to equilibrium. And the image that I have of that, do you remember those, I'm sure they still make them, but I remember when I was a kid there were these, uh, I, I think of them as schmooze, those, I'm, I'm sure they're all different forms, but these kind of plastic toys that are weighted in the bottom. And any way you shove it down, it bounces back up. Well, that's how the organism is. And any time you put a force in and move it in one direction, it tends to move back. So there's a reactive component. And that's very clear in the case of drugs. That you give any drug, you give a stimulant, it will be followed by depression. Uh, you, give it a, uh, you give a drug that makes you feel high, sometime later you're going to feel down. And if you use any drug frequently, the body will neutralize it. So that as you take it, a, a drug very frequently, the interesting effects that you get at the beginning stop. Look at the way coffee is used today. Its entheogenic potential has disappeared completely. Most people drink it only because they don't feel normal without it anymore, which is, a, which, is, which is the essence of drug dependence. That's just what happens. Drugs create their own need. The more you use them, the more you need them just to feel normal. That's how the body reacts to neutralize anything. And I think that's both a physical process and a mental process. There, uh, Norman Zinberg, again, the study that he's involved in now, is looking at the ways that the second member of a family to be put on phenothiazines, that's tranquilizers like Thorazine, reacts. So that if one member of a family goes crazy and they're put on, on Thorazine, let's say, often the response is adequate. But if a second member of the family later requires treatment with the same sorts of drugs, it's much less effective. There's a much lower incidence of success in a second person in a family. It's as if people somehow learn to compensate for the effect of a drug. So I think that can be both be a learning effect and a physical effect, but it's a very clear principle. And with some drugs, that happens terribly fast, as in the case of putting tobacco into your system by smoking. With others, it may happen relatively slowly. Chocolate, same thing, was an entheogenic drug. We have the, the world's expert on chocolate is sitting over here, Mr. Ott, who I hope will say something about that. He's written the definitive book on chocolate. Uh, the name, the botanical name of chocolate, theobroma, means food of the gods. Chocolate was considered a sacred plant by Indians of, of southern Mexico. Uh, it is not, doesn't behave very much as a sacred plant today, maybe for a few people. Uh, and, you know, the same principle holds to these drugs that we're calling entheogens here tonight. They don't have any inherent potential to put people in touch with the divine or the absolute ground of being. That's up to us, whether we use them that way or make them work that way. And if they're overused, and if people take them very frequently, and if they become ordinary and commonplace, that potential will disappear as surely as it has with all the others. Tobacco, for that matter, too, was a... Uh, when it first came to the, uh, the, new, the old world, uh, it was a magical plant from the new world. The, the Spanish, when they found the uh, Indians smoking, had no word even in their vocabulary for smoking. They described it as drinking. They saw people drinking smoke. Uh, there was no smoking in the old world before 1492. All the hashish and opium that were eaten in Europe, what were used in Europe and Asia, were eaten. Nobody got the idea of smoking them. Uh, when tobacco first came to Europe, it was used as a magical, precious substance. It was also so harsh. This is, as I said earlier, that cigarette addiction doesn't take back very far, because early forms of tobacco were so harsh you couldn't inhale them deeply or often. You could just take one or two tokes on it. But people who did that 
used it much as marijuana was used in this culture more recently. That is, you took this to have a major alteration in consciousness, that everything whirled around and you fell over on the ground, and social authorities were horrified at what they saw. <laughs> and of course, if you think about it, who is going to use a new drug when it comes into the culture? It's not going to be the establishment. It's going to be the deviants. It's going to be... <laughs> so... The, the ways that the, that the culture thinks about drugs are very much shaped by who first gets their hands on it. And by and large, the people in a culture to first get their hands on a new drug are not going to give it a very good reputation. They're going to be very feared by the, the mainstream culture. Uh, and that happened with tobacco. And it's very interesting to look at the history of what happened with laws as tobacco went eastward. It first got to Spain, and then England, and then France, and it marched around the world to the east. In uh, Russia and Turkey, Turkey of all places, which became so... Uh, closely associated with tobacco, the death penalty was imposed for possession of tobacco with, for the first 10 or 15 years after it was there. That did not work, as prohibitions against drugs never work. And I think legislatures who still dream that you can somehow affect people's drug-taking behavior in any way except for the worse by passing laws should go back and look at the history of the anti-tobacco legislation in the 1500s. It did not work. What did happen, however, was that as tobacco became more commonplace and it lost its significance as a magical plant and people began to use it more frequently, it also lost its power to alter consciousness, possibly in an interesting way for many people. So the main message I would just like to leave you with at the opening of this conference is that, as I say, there are no good drugs or bad drugs. Drugs are what we make of them. The interesting, what we talk about as the interesting potentials of drugs are really the interesting potentials of us. Uh, and drugs are one way of realizing those potentials. And for some people, they may prove to be legitimate. So I'll thank you there. I'd be happy to answer a few questions. Yeah, um, uh, well, I run a lot, and I'm just curious. Um, when I smoke, like, indic I think it's indica, and I may be wrong. That's why I'm asking. Um, is sativa a less harsh marijuana, or is there such a thing as a less harsh marijuana that, that is a breed? or a, um, Well, I'm sure there are harsher and less harsh varieties of marijuana, but I suspect that has as much to do with the way that it was cured and dried and uh, with tar content and the moisture content as much as it does on, uh, on resin content. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I think... Uh, you know, the, that how harsh the smoke is really varies with a lot of things. There is research that shows that marijuana smoke has more tars in it than tobacco smoke, and some people have uh, tried to make it, uh, that into uh, implying that it's also more irritating. I think that the irritation of smoke has a lot to do with how much you take in over time, and most tobacco smokers take in much more smoke than marijuana smokers. You know also that um, the runner's high, as it's been called, uh, has been shown to be neutralized uh, in part or in great amount by giving people narcotic antagonists uh, which block the effects of opiates and that suggests that the endorphin system which are the brain's own opiate analogs are at work in that and that might be another example of the way that what we call natural highs really may have the same final common pathway as highs that people experience when they take analogous substances from plants <laughs> Well, there has been a lot of that research. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the literature. There's uh, uh, one person who's done a lot of that is Stanley Krippner. Um, and the, I'm, I'm sure you could f track a lot of that down through the Association for Transpersonal Psychology, uh, which is in the San Francisco area, and publishes a journal called Transpersonal Psychology. Uh, again, I think, you know, that, that those kinds of potentials are potentials of the human mind, and that's possibly one way of releasing them. Uh, some of the psychedelic drugs have particularly been associated with that, and the, the use of yahe or ayahuasca in um, Amazonian Indian cultures uh, is often credited with, making, with giving people visions that have uh, valid content. I uh, spent time with one shaman in uh, Colombia who was an ayahuascaro, a yahero, who was main uh, method of, he was a healer who mostly worked with sick people and would cook up a brew of this plant that has uh, a group of chemicals called beta carbolines. Harmaline is one of them. They're related to tryptamines and the other indoles. And uh, one uh, kind of use that he made of it, he, he would often be consulted by uh, people who had had a missing person in their families who would come to him with a photograph, say, and uh, he would then take this drug and in his vision see the whereabouts of the person. Now, I, I didn't get a chance to verify any of this, but he would give people very specific information about you know, what had happened to the person. And, and in that culture, there was great belief in the validity of these kinds of visions.
uh, back there. Could you speak at some length on DMT, both synthetic and used in this culture, and the natural 